Euros participants, transfer action, Carrington refurbishments and more. And the United Twins need to speak about it. Blessings to everybody inside, including yourself, Captain. Yeah. Make sure you're hitting that like button, subscribing if you're new, sharing to your friends and frenemies for more of the United Twins. We're going to be covering a, a quite a few things and we're kicking it off with the Euros. And we've got a lot to say, rounding it up kind of with, with some involvement from Manchester United players as well. So in terms of the Euros, we've seen quite a few things take place and, and in some ways, you know, it has been an interesting competition with sure. teams you wouldn't expect to show up doing exactly that. But then again, that always seems to be the case with these international competitions. Shock results in the group stages. I mean, Belgium's loss against Slovakia and Romelu Lukaku's uh, horrific luck up front overall. Um, Croatia not being able to get over the hump in what could be a final run for the likes of Luka Modric, Ivan Perisic and a few others internationally. Of course, the tournament kicked off with Scott McTominay and Scotland being drummed by the host Germany. And unfortunately for the Tartan army, they won't be progressing any further. And that continues their failure to successfully pass the group stage in any of the major competitions Scotland have been involved in. I honestly think that it would be tough to not touch on an underwhelming group stage for England as well, who were grouped with Denmark, Slovenia and Serbia. And some things really stood out to me. I think in that first game, there was a massive imbalance on the left hand side due to Foden and Trippier both not being direct players. There were other reasons perhaps, and, yeah. and that was a completely opposite dynamic to having Bukayo Saka and Carl Walker on the other wing. Performances individually have somewhat shifted, but overall, the midfield just hasn't clicked. Creativity-wise, players seem to almost be extremely nervous in their styles of play, especially after that Serbia game. Wayward passes, loose touches, the sloppy mistakes that you wouldn't expect with the quality on show. Many people will tell you all that matters are the wins and topping group sheet, see, which they did in the end, but not without a couple of draws that may foreshadow where this side could go wrong this time around, having reached the Euro 2020 final. My assumptions were to be a little more ambitious in making those changes if I were Gareth Uffgate, Copy. when you have the pool of talent on the bench waiting to make an impact, I think ultimately you had to find a balance between change and continuity, considering the fact that your current product after three games shouldn't strike yourself with a high level of confidence. But when the game will get tougher and more challenging, it will slow down in the knockout rounds. So how does everyone else feel about England's chances of, of going far in the knockout rounds, potentially making a run to get back to the Euros finals? Let me know in the comments. Carrying on from that as well, Cappy. I think Denmark, who funny enough, ended up being the second place team due to Slovenia's coach being booked. I think that's how it went. So showcase, they showcased a few things that we can reference perhaps back at Manchester United. Watching Rasmus Hoyland up front again has somewhat highlighted his weaknesses, things he needs to work on. And, and maybe we will get to see some good in their round of 16 fixture against Germany. <laughs> Tough task. But for me, I'm keeping this 100% constructive, by the way. Before the police get on my case, hey. I have to say that. His physical tools from the very beginning have always provided me with hope that he will grow in multiple areas. Um, and that will have to be the case. He's not a dominant force aerially, still has a way to go in terms of pinning defenders and protecting the ball, bringing others into play and his timing inside the box at times lets him down. Things that I believe we saw this season and if the rumors about a potential forward coming to Old Trafford are true, then that just strengthens the competition and lowers the over-reliance on one player, which for me, is a positive rather than a negative. 
Of course, we don't know what will be happening with Christian Eriksen this summer, but his triumphant story, his triumphant return overall, cannot be understated. Like kicking off the tournament with a trademark finish and becoming the leading appearance maker for Denmark. Huge congratulations to him. And who knows? He could have a deep run in this competition. Yeah. We've seen shocks. Cappy, myself, we've all spoken about the shocks. Whether it's been on this recording, whether it's been outside of this recording. For me, this has been the, the tournament of the unexpected. Maybe that will continue in a round of 16. Well, I'll tell you what. Huh? It's Bruno Fernandes. Diogo Delo has been involved. Portugal. I've had a relatively smooth group stage. That was until their shocking 2-0 defeat against Georgia, which sent utter shockwaves throughout the competition. I believe yeah. their star, Napoli's very own Gavicha Kabadaskeria, and Georgia's Mikodadze, who's currently the competition's joint top scorer, I believe. Fact check me, see it. Fired them through to a round of 16 tie against Spain, which was a phenomenal result in their very first major international tournament. Back to Portugal though. They naturally were one of the favorites and a standout team for me due to their attacking talent all over the field. And not everybody's contributing. The likes of Rafael Valeau, I will call him out on that. Cristiano Ronaldo still going strong. And of course, Bruno being a game changer, which is no surprise at international level. Naturally, they have been caught on the tougher side of the draw, which includes teams like Germany, France, Belgium, even though they, they've looked far from being one of, the, one of the world's top international sides. That will have to be revised. <laughs> Spain, of course, too, as mentioned earlier. So it would be a winning achievement to replicate their 2016 triumph. Who, you know what? I haven't really spoke. I haven't really thought about this. But who are your favourites? Who are your favourites to win Euro 2024? Let us know in the comments section. Let's have some fun, people. Quick mention over to the Copa America, where we for sure have had our disappointments with Jamaica out of the competition after losses against losses to Mexico and Ecuador. We did score our first ever goal in the competition from Mikel Antonio, so it wasn't all doom and gloom. Mm -hmm. Far from that, in fact. Even though I will scream until the cows come home about the treatment we receive from certain officials. It's an absolute disgrace, but that's an argument for another day. Mm. I've seen the, the VAR footage, the refusal, the contradictions, all of that stuff. But the reigning champs, Argentina, are through to the knockout rounds. Two wins in two with... And, and Alejandro Garnacho, sorry, is yet to play. That's where I was going. Mm. With this being his first major tournament at senior level, being one of those young players is more than understandable. Could you see him get some time against Peru? They're through. They'll still want to win that final game, but potentially he could play much like we're hearing for England. Bobby could be starting that that round of 16 game would be interesting to see because with what we saw from England, him and, and another guy and Cole Palmer as well, somewhat changed the dynamic of how that team played, especially focusing in the middle of the park. Kobe really added a, a different element to that team when he was given the opportunity and ample minutes to play. Could Garnacho be, be given some time to impress and to stake a claim as they enter the knockout rounds in the Copa America as well. So you guys know about this Joshua Zirxi links. And, and, uh, I did a bit of research about the player okay. and, and how he may make an impact at Manchester United. Not guaranteed, of course. Currently enjoying time in Bologna, where this season in Serie A, they qualified for Champions League football by finishing in that fifth spot. Italy had the extra allocated European position. His stature is tall, which instantly gives off the indication that he can play physical, which in, is the case. Can probably master the arts of hold up play with your back to goal. Also, he does well when being asked to bring others into play. 
quick link ups can drop deep and get involved which doesn't happen a lot at manchester united at this point of time yeah. when we think about our center forwards they've been rather stationary with minimal touches even on a decent day there are of course expectations of that changing with our hierarchy changing and of course new potential coaching additions may already be confirmed by now in Ruud van Nistelrooy, former United player, PSV head coach, and René Hake, who's the current go-ahead Eagles manager. I saw earlier that that was all but confirmed. Well, it was confirmed that he will be leaving and, and joining United's coaching staff under Eric Ten Hag. He will be, yeah, well, his new contract will be announced real soon too. These two appointments are interesting because you are bringing in names who are good enough, have already been coaches, which in my eyes should elevate the level of coaching staff at the club's disposal dude and that provides different ideologies if all attempts to collaborate succeed how does everyone feel about the current shakeups? but back to Xerxes another positive is his knack of being in the right place at the right time inside the opposition's area already we are discovering a few differences between Rasmus Hoyland and Xerxes which as mentioned before, can help to improve both both through competition and training. Yeah. Similar profiles with differing abilities to execute specific skills here and there. Would you prefer a, a Xerxes or a more experienced, guaranteed goal scorer? Even though nothing is really guaranteed, I should probably say a more assured option, perhaps. Which would you choose? Manuel Ugarte is another player being heavily linked to Manchester United. I think there was news going around on Friday that he will be leaving Paris Saint-Germain. Don't know how true that is. So I guess in the next few weeks, we will find out those next steps. Once again, if true. As a defensive midfielder, 23 years of age, already showing the characteristics of being a solid midfielder with the technical prowess on ball to change direction quickly navigate out of deep positions and has a comfortability in operating in those deep positions also he has the confidence to progress the play defensively has the qualities of being able to read when to engage and when to stay in terms of pressing covering for out of position teammates make sound decisions in transition after turnover was a legal champion contended a couple of times with sporting as well currently competing in the Copa America with Uruguay as one of the two starting pivots. I like what I've been reading about, seeing in small spurts, strengthening that spine. My question is, if Manchester United bring in both Xerxes and Ugarte, who are the two main names at this moment of time, doesn't mean it's going to come to fruition, but at this moment of time, just imagine, put yourself in this scenario. Which other position or positions would you prioritize? In fact, just pick one. Left back, center back. Which, which will you choose? This is one of the final topics I wanted to touch on in this episode because it has been somewhat controversial for good reason around the United fan base. And it all began on the 14th of this month with the club communicating that they're will be a 50 million pound project to revamp and modernize the Carrington training complex which has already commenced by the time of us recording that of course was received as good news i still think it is fantastic news in regards to just modernizing a training ground that had severely regressed in quality over time due to a lack of innovation on the part of the glazer ownership and entire club hierarchy failing to grasp how detrimental that could be for a modern day sports side in comparison to many of our peers. Facts. The conundrum that arose from this news came from the women's team having to move, well, the women's team and the academy having to move out from their relatively newly built training complex to make way for the men's first team. I will clarify a few details now. Manchester United, and, and these are from articles from The Athletic, numerous publications manchester united men's team is set to use the women's first team building during the renovations being carried out at carrington during the 2024-25 season all season long 
in a move that will see the women's side asked to use portable cabins work will be carried out on the gym medical nutrition and recovery facilities and follows the 10 million redevelopment of the women's and academy building last summer the plan is for the men to use the revamped women's and academy building which will see the women's team and academy using portable cabins when schedules cross over important part there united statement when announcing the carrington revamp said that temporary modifications will be used to allow players to continue training on site administrative staff who had been working elsewhere at Carrington have already moved into the women's team building during the summer United say they considered temporary temporarily sorry relocating teams to an alternative f facility to ease pressure at Carrington but this was ruled out for performance reasons the pitches, fitness and nutrition facilities there are of significantly higher quality than what would have been available elsewhere. Mm. They say access to them will remain available to all teams through what the club call a phased approach. Many were not satisfied with that, especially after Sir Jim Ratcliffe's priority to the first team comments. At a club like Manchester United, I believe, any new investor or, or part owner needs to be careful of the decisions they make in quick succession and how they interact with a, a ready to engage fan base, an active fan base. With all of the successes of the women's team since their inception, qualifying for the Champions League, winning the FA Cup, almost winning the WSL in 2022-23. Each summer, there appears to be regressions and no signs of wanting to build and create a dominant outfit despite ending this season on, on a high much like the men's team frustrations were at an all-time high and and much of that in my opinion is due to the aforementioned points Ineos do not want to develop bad habits this early on i'm seeing some good but that doesn't mean that the concerning or the bad should just be brushed aside not at all. So I think this will be one of the many warnings for Sir Jim Ratcliffe, Sir, Dale Br Sir Dave Brailsford and the entire Ineos contingent, the hierarchy that are working within Manchester United. Because much like the backlash they received for this situation, and I've included the context of the stories that have been, that, that I've read, and that have been put out into the public but still the backlash received could hurt them in the long run when it comes to building a connection with the skeptical fans it's been a big one today a big 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 video with, with us touching on international actions some of our guys out there on international duty of course transfer news which every single day is ongoing and, and, and just news revolving around the club. Let us know if we missed out on anything. Anything you want us to report over this summertime. Any content, content perhaps you want us to, to do over this summer. Pre-season is almost back. July, mid-July, early July, I think they'll be reporting. Some of the players will be reporting back to duty. And then mid-July, we, we get going again. So it's almost like we, football hasn't ever left us. Uh, at any point this year ladies and gentlemen so if you enjoy this video hit a like subscribe if you need share to your friends and frenemies check out cm22ent.co.uk for articles when the new season begins links to the videos and my entire creative portfolio ladies and gentlemen go and check it out Follow me over on Twitch at CM22ENT. I haven't been active enough. I'm not going to lie. I want to be more active. Mm. But maybe I just need to find some games. Because right now, the sports ones ain't really doing it for me. So maybe you can suggest which games I should play over on Twitch. And we get back going over there, ladies and gentlemen. Follow, follow me on X at CM22ENT. I hope you all have a blessed rest of your day. Productive day ahead wonderful weekend enjoy the euros returning because on on the day of this video's release the euros will be back too we'll see you lots in a bit